What is Vedic Astrology and how to choose the right gemstone? In today's comprehensive video, I'm actually going to discuss both these topics in full detail, explaining to you the principles of Vedic Astrology, the reason why people believe in it, and then once a gemstone is recommended, how to buy that right gemstone based on the four C's plus OT principles we as gemologists will look at. The issue I actually have right now is that a lot of people go to astrologists blindly and just listen to exactly what they recommend without understanding if they're getting the right gemstone that fits their issue or circumstance. Without understanding anything about Vedic astrology, they just blindly accept the astrologers. The issue with that is that a lot of these astrologers just use simple principles by recommending gemstones based on these particular houses or these particular planets without understanding the person's circumstance and the reason why they need the gemstone in the first place. It's like going to a doctor and you having a throat problem or a stomach ache and instead of the do doctor giving you a, a, a medicine that fixes that issue like the throat, sore throat or your stomach digestive problem, they give you a painkiller and just send you home. So this does not resolve the issue and this does not fix the circumstances that the reason why you went to astrology in the first place. And then once a recommendation is made, the next issue is that a lot of people just don't understand the quality of gemstones they should look at and how you should get a proper gemstone that will fulfill their, you know, their needs and wants. Currently, the gemstones most people are wearing are really bad and low quality and it has b pretty bad effects as well. And again, this is the reason is because they're going to an astrologist who doesn't know nothing about gemstones. So by the end of this video, I'm hoping but you will learn both these topics in full detail, maybe analyze your own chart, see your own circumstance, and then you choosing the right gemstone, bind the correct quality gemstone that could fulfill and fix your destiny and needs. So let's go ahead and start with this comprehensive video. What is Vedic Astrology or Jyotish? Before knowing what it is, we should first understand why Hindus believe in it or why it was created in the first place. The first concept we should discuss is the Hindu philosophy regarding the meaning of life and how it was created. These concepts have been explained in the Upanishads and it is agreed upon that these are the central ideas. Brahma is the Godhead or the center energy. Atma is the divine core of personality and has the same energy source as Brahma but is located in each and living soul. Dharma is a law that expresses and maintains the unity of creation. Karma is the web of cause and effect. Samsara is the cycle of birth and death. And finally, moksha, the spiritual liberation that is the life's supreme goal. So the first concept I actually want to discuss is in detail and the most relevant for Vedic astrology is karma. Karma is a core principle in Hinduism that whatever action one takes, it will cause an effect both positive and negative. Therefore, the intent and actions of an individual cause influences the future of that individual effect. For example, if one studies hard in math, that's the cause, one will do well in his or her math test and gain mathematical knowledge effect. If one robs someone, again a cause, they will go to jail or also get robbed later on in life. That is an effect. So what is a Hindu's ultimate goal? So karma is like an educational force whose purpose is to teach the individual to act in harmony with dharma, not to pursue in selfish interests at the expense of others. In this sense, life is like a school one can learn. One can graduate, one can skip a grade, or can stay behind. As long as the depth of karma remains, however, a person has to keep coming back for further education. This is the basis of samsara, the cycle of birth and death. 
The ultimate goal for a Hindu is for the Atma to connect to Brahma, the source of all energy, and to end the cycle of rebirth. This invisible energy is actually everywhere in the cosmos and has been proven in astrology physics. In fact, the energy we can observe today in the world as defined in astrology physics is, or as normal matter is only 5% of all energy, while 95% is either dark matter or dark energy, which we cannot see. So this is how the concept of Vedic astrology is connected to us by explaining the invisible energy that affects us. Thus, astrology is a method of understanding one's karma and analyzing different astrological positions. Therefore, one's life's good fortune and misfortune represents what we have done in the past and current deeds. These are our karma actions. So how does Vedic astrology fit into this and predict our future? In Vedic astrology, it is believed that the seven world objects Sun, Moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, and the two other nodes, Rahu and Ketu, help us see what karmic actions we have done in the past and therefore can foretell the future. It is believed in Vedic astrology that the rays of these planets or nodes show us our fortunes and misfortunes, and like in an accounting book, shows us our good or bad karmic deeds in the past and therefore can tell if we can get certain aspect in life easily or we need to struggle to get it. The position of these objects is determined by your place and birth time, which can foretell what your future will be. The nine objects are positioned in 12 different houses, which represent different aspects of one's life. These positions are where the planets are set in the sky at the time of birth. So the simple image I'm showing right here are the 12 zodiac signs which are always there in the sky. So on the time of birth and place, these zodiac signs will be moved in according to your position. And then the planets are cast on top of it. That's how a Vedic astrology chart is made. Alright, so in the next few slides I'm going to discuss the different meanings of each house. Okay, so let's discuss the different house meanings just to give you an idea of what each house represents in your life. So the first house represents physical trait and personality. The second house represents wealth through investments. Actually, as you can see in the slide, there are mo much more details about each house, but I'm just gonna say very briefly and quickly. It's a summary of each house. The third house is mother and courage of start or work. The fourth house is family, happiness, and property. The fifth house represents house of the crown, education, or your children. The sixth house represents disease, job and service, and status in society. The seventh house represents life partner, husband or wife, your business partner, or accidents you have in life. The eighth house represents unearned income, or the time of your death. The ninth house represents father, guru, and luck. And guru means like a teacher. And luck is, of course, how lucky you are in life. The tenth house is a very important house and actually it represents your authority in life, business, success, and it's called the apex of the horoscope. The eleventh house is profit or income from your work and finally the 12th house is the expenses and bed comforts you, or pleasures you have in life so how does different position of planets influence your future the planets positions are determined which aspect in your life you will get easier or without any effort or will have more difficulty or denial for such an event wedding astrologers based their knowledge given in the Vedas or by their forefathers or gurus and check to see where these planets are positioned in your chart and how they are related to each other. These positions influence the positive or negative relationship and also can foretell when an event will occur. 
Planets which are in exalted signs or in friendly houses will have stronger rays coming to us and this will make this particular aspect of your life a little easier. Planets in debilitated signs or enemy houses with or has has less rays coming to us so they have more difficulty in achieving that aspect in life or delay it or may even deny it as well. The relationship in these of these planets and of how they assist each other or take the power away from each other by increasing it or reducing it. This ex explains how the chart is uh, is checked. So how do we know if the planets in the chart are in a positive or negative positions? The system which I personally found the most logical and practical is the caste system, which I have provided the links below and also have provided below the video so you can learn more about it. This system is based on mathematics and therefore it shows how the rays and points are divided among the planets and how they are related to each other. These computations were super complex and were earlier done only for kings and rajas in India as it would take an astrologer many many days to do it by hand. We now have an excel file that does all these calculations and computations for you easily. So we don't need to do all these, these mathematical computations. With this mathematical calculation, it, the system actually takes into account what the planets do to each other, if they're in fair, even if they're in a favorable or negative position. It doesn't mean that you will get that aspect in life easy or not. Quality of how the planet is positioned is only one factor. Timing of, of event occurring and how the planets distribute points to each other or how the houses are helping or hurting each other is another factor. So this is actually the most comprehensive system which I have seen personally. For more details, I recommend re reading the Cast Dimension Reader 1 book by Guruji Krishna Jugalji. I would also like to personally thank him for teaching us this complex system. And please do check this book out. Okay, so before we start the discussion about gemstones and the quality of gemstones we need for Vedic astrology and how to choose the right gemstones, I first, I first thought why not we just show, I just show you a cast chart and explain to you the, process, the complex process of all the calculations which is required when we are doing cast analysis. So in this chart, I actually provided an example of a person who was a clerk who became a billionaire later on. And the first thing we had to do actually to, to make this chart is you need to type the person's details in this cast Excel file, which is the uh, birth date, the time, and the place of birth of where he was born. And once that is inputted, then you'll see the, all these calculations of all the planet placements in, in the natal chart and all the, the different divisional charts. So this is the natal chart, these are the divisional charts, which is in, a, in a other Excel file sheets. I cannot explain to you in full details, I'm just giving you a brief, quick summary about this. So in this, you could see this is the first house and the sun and moon is located there. This is the second house, Saturn is located there. And then you can see it's the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, sixth. And all these calculations are the degrees and longitude latitude of these planets based on when you were born and at that time. This also shows the relationship of these planets of each house and which aspect in life you could could get easy and more difficult again just very very brief really fast explanation and i cannot go in full details regarding this now to check the quality of the planets there is a this, this divisional charts which checks the planet position based on the natal chart and all the divisional charts so in this particular chart this mercury moon or is in in exalted signs and that's why you can see it's blue because they're they're situ situated in the sixth sign from the re from their respective house. Saturn is also in a positive place because Saturn is actually um, located at its house. Here is shown red, though it should be in green because because it's red with another house. Anyways, more complications, but I'll <laughs> continue with the analysis of this chart. So now let's look at the chart based on all these various calculations. Mars and Mercury relationship is also a 410 relationship and Mars has less points and Mercury has a having high points which makes Mars strong for all the houses 
Mars is strong. This is because Mars has less points here and Mercury has high points. And all the points which Mercury gets in the house were given to Mars. And this you can see here. So high points mean anything above 12. Anything below 12 you can see is red. So anything be above 12 is it, it makes things easier. And you're not for getting things done in, in that particular, particular planet time period. Venus and Mercury also has a side of Mars which has less points. So the Mars also has a fourth aspect of Venus and Mercury. And because of that, also these two planets have strong points as you can see here. And therefore these three planets have strong points, have more than 12 points in all these houses. Which makes them, you know, whenever the, these planets time period comes, it's easy for him to get things done and easier aspect in life. So all these reasons, three planets being in a strong exalted sign or in their own house, like in C, Saturn is located in Capricorn, and Moon and Mercury are in six house from, the, this is a Moon house, one, two, three, four, five, six, and Mercury, also six house from its own house, one, two, three, four, five, six. So because of these three planets being in high quality houses and because of these planets relationship and getting high points above 12 points like three of them that is the reason why this guy became petrol pump uh, clerk to become a billionaire so i hope this brief discussion was quite useful and let me just show you some more divisional charts and all the different calculations so this also shows all the different divisional charts the relationship and all and the positives and negative so as you can see this chart this this excel file and this system is really complex and that there's no simple rule i'm just choosing the right stone and planet based on just if the planet is located here or there you have to take into account many many factors before we decide what gemstone is suited for you so now let's discuss about the different gemstones how does gemstones help in vedic astrology there are two schools of thoughts regarding what type of gemstones someone should wear. Either positive type of gemstones or negative type of gemstones. The first school is called the Anukul Wad school, which means it's for favorable or lucky planets. So the lucky gemstone is what we should wear. Then there's another school called the Pratikul Wad school, which is whatever is the weak planet or the malefic planet you should be wearing that type of stone. And personally, what did I believe in? I actually don't believe in either of the school as I have already discussed in, earlier in this video because um, neither of them actually fix the issue which you have. We have to analyze a chart and see your particular situation and then accordingly prescribe this gemstone that fits your need. Gemstones are very important correction tools and you have to be very careful when using them. One has to analyze a chart to see what is deficient and then can use this gemstone to enhance or help that situation. Currently, most of the pundits just recommend gemstones that represent benefic houses like Trikona houses, which are the first, fifth or ninth houses or Khandra houses, which are the fourth, seventh or tenth house. They also avoid malefic houses like the 6th or 8th or 12th house. However, are these strictly bad houses? The 8th house can cause accidents but also can provide unearned income from wills and legacies. The 6th house can cause enemies and disease but can also win litigations or income from service. The 12th house can give you comforts of sleeping in a cozy bed etc. So, just because these are malefic houses doesn't mean you cannot wear uh, gemstones on these particular houses. So what gemstones does each planet represent? I actually show you an image on this slide right here. And you can see the sun is a Leo sign and it represents ruby. Moon represents pearl. Mars represents coral. Mercury represents emerald. Jupiter represents yellow sapphire, Venus represents diamond, Saturn represents blue sapphire, Rahu represents hezonite garnet, and Ketu represents cat's eye. 
There are substitutes if you, one finds that above gemstones expensive. For example, if the yellow sapphire is recommended for a Jupiter, we can instead replace it for yellow topaz or yellow citrine, which are much cheaper gemstones compared to a yellow sapphire. Other replacements usually should match the color of the gemstones above. So if you're looking for a sun gemstone, for example, ruby is a red stone. So we have to find an equivalent red gemstone. And if you're looking for a Saturn or a blue sapphire, then we have to find an equivalent blue color gemstone. So I hope that makes sense and let's continue. What quality gemstone should one wear? One should buy a gemstone that is natural, clean and as vivid in color as possible. The best quality gemstones are based on the 4Cs plus OT methods which I have used in my previous gemstone videos. And if you haven't taken a look about in these videos, I recommend to take a look so you understand what I'm talking about. The 4Cs are color, clarity, cared weight, cut and OT is the origin and treatment of the particular gemstone. It is highly recommended not to buy highly included gemstones or gemstones treated by chemicals as this will affect these gemstones natural effects in a negative direction. Therefore buying a high quality Vedic gemstone is like buying any high quality gemstone in general. It should be natural or untreated and it should have no eye visible inclusions. I will continue about this discussion in the next slide as well. So continuing the discussion on what quality gemstone one should wear, having some inclusions in natural gemstones is okay. They are naturally grown that way, especially high quality stones like rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. It is just it is just normal to have some inclusions, and therefore, I mean it. People are quite particular, oh no, they have this and that, but you have to understand, if the gemstone is absolutely clean, especially emeralds, then you have to play an exceptionally high price, which in the end, I don't know if it makes a huge difference in the effect in Vedic Astrology. So continuing, though it should be eye clean as possible, so it, it should not affect the light rays. This positive energy coming from gemstones, which is replacing energy you want from your particular planet. Does it have to be absolutely clean under the microscope or loop clean? Personally, no, as old Vedic times, they did not have microscopes to check gemstone inclusions. So in the olden days, they just looked at a gemstone and see, oh wow, it's nice, sparkly, clean. And they didn't look at it under the microscope, so they won't see all the particular imperfections inside. It also, the gemstone should have a clean crystal in transparency and it should not be cloudy based on that particular gemstone well, properties. Okay, so this is a question which I get always. What particular weight or care weight or rati gemstone should one have to wear? There is nowhere in Vedic scriptures that is written or mentioned how to determine what weight or gemstone one should wear. Also, it is Im more important to get a high quality gemstone than a bigger looking gemstone. For example, you might have a limited budget just to get to get a particular gemstone. So don't strive for that particular rati or carrot weight just to make sure that you know you're listening to your astrologer or pundit. Is it better to get a bad looking six carat emerald or a top grade one carat emerald? And I'm gonna show this picture in the next slide. So is it better to get an included large or a clean small? So the one on the left is a 6 carat highly included and not transparent emerald and you can see it's not a very pleasant looking stone. Versus the one on the right which is a 1.15 carat eye clean and transparent emerald. So which is better? Personally I will take the smaller nice sparkly nice looking emerald over the one which is highly included and just not attractive. So in this slide I actually want to discuss the problem with astrology gemstones which are currently been worn among most people right now which I have seen with multiple people. The gemstones are usually bought without understanding what they are and how to determine their quality. To determine the quality of gemstones one should also consult a gemologist the same way one consults a Vedic astrologer in trying to get the remedy or checking one's Vedic charts. 
Astrologers, even though they might be good in looking at charts, generally don't have good understanding of gemstones. Are they 100% natural or have been subject to different treatments? Treatments include heat treatment, chemically diffused, lead glass, dye, oil, wax, or resin treatment. They also don't understand the four C's plus OT principles, which I have discussed re regarding gemstones. And finally, is it a genuine gemstone or a substitute, like glass or plastic or synthetic? Only a gemologist can tell this. And then in the next slide, I'm actually going to show you images of what people typically wear in India for astrology purposes and why is this straw. Okay, so these are the stones which are typically sold in India for astrology purposes. On the left are actual rubies, sapphires, yellow sapphires, and emeralds which are sold. And it, you can see they are they are actually natural gemstones which which fits the uh, treatment section, but they are highly included, not transparent, not clean at all. So will this have a good effect on wearing of Vedic astrology purposes? Personally, I don't think so. But these are the type of gemstones which they sell. And then on the right is dyed silamanite, which is actually not even a ruby, sapphire, or emerald. So silamanite is just a general gemstone which is highly included and they just dye it to that particular color. So this is even worse that they're even selling these as rubies, sapphires, and emeralds, but they're not actually rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. So these are the issues which you see with gemstones which are sold for astrological purposes in India. So how does a high quality and untreated stone should look like? We, I actually don't want to brag here, but these are just some gemstones which we have sold in the past or still have in stock. Like the one in the middle is actually 11 karat unheated yellow sapphire, which is GI certified. And we still have that in stock. While the others, like the one in the left, is a 2 karat unheated Mozambique ruby. On the right is a no oil, absolutely clean emerald from Zambia. In the bottom, in the left corner, is a 10 karat Sri Lankan blue sapphire. In the middle is a 6 karat untreated ruby. And in the right is also a 2 karat untreated Burma blue sapphire. So these are just examples of gemstones which are in high quality fits the four C's plus OT principles which I've discussed in my previous videos and which you could buy. The only thing is you do have to pay a premium price for it. But I still believe you should buy a smaller, cleaner, nice looking gemstone which is also a good investment in the future and will help in your Vedic astrology purposes than getting a low quality gemstone as I showed in the previous video. Because in the end, those have no value and the only reason they're selling it to you is because they want it um, to sell it and they believe you get influenced by, you know, getting blackmail of your Vedic astrology purposes. But buying a gemstone should be also getting a nice looking stone which you appreciate and wear every day. And that will also give you a positive mindset when you wear it in general. I hope that makes sense. and. I hope you found this whole exercise useful and do let me know if you have any other questions and please subscribe to our channel and thank you for watching.